What happened to me in my life is statistically impossible. So someone upstairs was looking out, yet I wasn't showing that respect of saying, I trust that you love me. I trust that everything's gonna be okay. Giving that trust to the universe, I've seen amazing, miraculous things start to happen in my life. You and your wife have the most amazing eyes. So having to stare directly at you and do this podcast, I feel like I'm slowly falling in love. So there you go. So now we now we can do this as I have to stare into those so, pools. So this is why you don't look at me often. This is why. I was like, I was like Scooter doesn't give me eye contact. You know, it's funny, the prince is right there because there's that famous joke of like, never look prince in the eyes, you'll fall in love. This is what you learn at the Jay Shadi <laughs> podcast. I love it, man. And you look different since the last time I saw you. Buddy. Yeah, shaved. Shaved. And you look well, though. You look great, man. Thanks, man. And, yeah. and I, wanted, I wanted to tell people because I, I think when people see people connecting, they don't realize sometimes how organically people meet. And I want to share that story, if that's great. okay. And you can, you can fill in the details. Let's do it. Uh, but it was a couple of years ago. We were at our mutual friend, Justin Baldoni's movie premiere. Yeah. He had the movie coming out five feet apart. Mm-hmm. And I went to the movie premiere. I was running late. I didn't think I was going to make it. I was like, oh gosh, I don't want to let Justin down. I really want to be there for him. And then I'm walking in and then I see you walking in. And I knew who you were based on all the incredible work you've been doing for two decades now or more. And, and, I, I, and I knew you. I was, and and I, I didn't was, know that. I was a fan of what you were putting out there and, I was, uh, and the positivity. So when I saw you, I got just as, just as excited. <laughs> so I got excited and I was in this space where I was like, I have to go and tell him because if someone's impacted your life or you love the artists they work with, the, the work that they do, today we're going to discuss all the philanthropy work you're doing. When you're into someone, I feel like it's so important to not go and ask for a picture, but to go and express how you feel about them. And so I came up to you and I was like, Scooter, I'm a big fan of all the work you're doing. Congratulations. And then when you said it back to me, and, and I remember the words you said, they were so powerful and it just showed me how present you were. And, and I think maybe, you know, people don't know this about you because not everyone gets to bump into you, but you were like, I, I said, the work you're doing is really important. Thank you for doing it. And you, you said, you're doing the most important work. And, well, and you, I meant it. Yeah. And it was, it really touched my heart. I was so, you know, I was so humbled and honored to hear that from you. And then we, we were like, well, let's get together. And I think you kind of looked at me when I said it as like, okay, yeah. <laughs> We're not really going to get together. <laughs> Definitely. And we ended up going for lunch. Our, you know, the our next wives day. Met. Yeah, the, our wives met. And um, we became friends, you know. And then uh, you joined us on a trip. And, you know, it's, uh, I just, I'm so happy to see your message getting louder and louder and bigger and bigger. Because I think uh, you're, you're giving people a lot of the things they need to hear and a lot of positivity and allowing them to slow down and take a breath. Yeah, thank you, man. And I've always felt that support from you. And we've had some amazing trips and, and some good walks and some good walks as well. Some really important walks and meaningful times in my life. And uh, you've always been so helpful, mentoring, supportive as well. And so thank you. But today, I think, you know, the fascinating thing for me is that you have these incredible artists that you founded. You then have the man behind the people, the work, the person. But then even far removed from that, you have the work that the man is doing behind the scenes. And so it's almost like you're twice removed. The, the real you, the, the behind the scenes version of you is almost so distant from what people experience on the front lines. That's what I want to discover today and share today because that's what I feel I got a glimpse of. Uh, yeah, I think you did. And um, I think it's so funny that we're doing this because we talked about doing this pre-COVID. <laughs> yeah. And then COVID hit and a lot of things happened. A lot of things changed. Um, and you know, for me, COVID was an opportunity to slow down and do some real self-reflection, um, and self-work, which I think we all should be doing at all times. You know, I, I really came to terms with the fact that as long as I'm breathing, I'm a student. Um, and it's funny that you start there because obviously my nickname is Scooter and my, my given name was Scott. And I can tell you, I don't remember ever liking the name Scott. Until now, you know, I, I didn't realize until I've did the work I've done really over the last six months um, that I kind of left Scott behind in a way and built something that I thought was powerful enough to be in the world, something that I thought deserved to be loved by the world. And 
um, I didn't realize subconsciously how much I had left that inner child behind. Um, and my friends didn't realize it and I was having fun, everything else, but I was always kind of trying to build something new because of, you know, you and I spoke about this. Um, one of the quotes that I loved, someone said, uh, many times we don't know our trauma because it was never ours. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my grandparents are Holocaust survivors and my parents went through what they went through. And I feel like I kind of inherited some of that where I always felt like, when is it going to get taken away? When are they going to show up and take it away from me? So I was always building for something else um, to protect me and my family, not realizing that everything that I ever needed was right here in the present. And uh, doing this work, I went back and got Scott. And I think you saw a glimpse of that. Certain friends of mine saw a glimpse of that. And I feel like coming out of COVID, I'm putting that more on the forefront. Yeah, I love hearing that. Yeah, I started there just because I think it's it's the root of today's conversation. You know, us sitting down here today is is two friends wanting to go deep in mm -hmm. a conversation we would have offline but online. And hearing you say that is so freeing, I'm sure, for everyone who's listening and watching for themselves too. Because I think all of us are holding on to a trauma that's not ours or or something that we experienced. Let's let's focus on that. Let's go back then to what were you like as a kid? Because I'm intrigued to know, I didn't know you then. What were you like? Like, were you always confident? Was there an insecurity? What is it that you were working through as a kid or at least in hindsight? You know, look, I, I out of respect for people that I love, there's certain things I'm not, not going to go into only because I realize now that we all see the world through our lens. Mm -hmm. And when you really start to do the work, you realize that things that happen to you a lot of times were happening to you because it's all that people knew, mm -hmm. you know, and that it's not about resenting anyone or being angry. It's actually about loving more and then changing the pattern, you know, because you're choosing that for yourself. Um, so what I can tell you is I was a very sensitive, loving kid and loved everybody, loved having fun, loved shining my light out there, but was super sensitive. Um, and I think as I grew up, I was, you know, I was raised for a tough world and I was raised by very loving people, but there was a lot of trauma, you know, that, you know, like I said, the Holocaust, like things happened. Um, and when people go through that, they're trying to protect their next generation. They're trying to protect their loved ones. So they're giving them that what you need to look out for. And I'm grateful for that in many ways because there's great things that come with that, but also as a child, you don't really have that rational thought until you're like six or eight years yeah. old. So you're interpreting things the way you are. You don't realize you're setting these patterns. Um, and, and I'm not embarrassed to say this. You know, one of the things I did during COVID, in fact, I'm, I'm not the opposite of embarrassed. I'm grateful to these people. I I, uh, I had canceled four times on something called the Hoffman process. Mm -hmm. And I finally went in October um, because, I, you know, friends were pushing me and saying, this is going to be great for you. And I was like, what do I need this for? Like I, and I finally went and it was the greatest gift I ever gave myself. And it was the first time in 20 years that I went no phone, no email, no TV. I was completely ingrained in this process. And funny enough, which is why you and I haven't connected, when I got out, everyone was like, okay, he's going to turn his phone back on. And I actually got a burner phone and didn't turn my actual phone back on until the end of the year. Wow. Um, until 2021, really. And I, you know... My team stepped up for me. I was kind of going through a couple different people and, you know, giving the suggestions and helping. And um, the artists that I work with were incredibly respectful of it and appreciative because, you know, I'd been there for them. And I remember them looking at me like, now it's time for us to be here for you and let you go through, what, you know, your learning and whatever. And, um, and I, I've really had a shift in my life. And uh, I couldn't be more grateful because you go through and things are going good you're seeing other people in their trauma. You're seeing other people with whatever they're going through. And you don't want to look at yourself because you're like, well, my life's so good. I, I have nothing to complain about. I don't, I don't need to do this work because who am I to even say I need help? You know, when people are really going through problems, I should just focus on the good things in my life. Mm. And what I realized is we all deserve the right to slow down and say, why am I hurting? What am I going through? What work can I do? Yeah. And um, I'm grateful that a lot of people that love me push me to do that. 
That's amazing. I'm so, when you told me you did that recently when we were talking, I was so happy. And the other conversation we had that was attached to that, it actually brought me so much joy because I feel like when someone in your life that you care for actually invests in themselves and now is saying no to certain opportunities or delaying events in their life or priorities in their life, like huge priorities. I mean, your artists have huge, like not huge, it's not astronomical careers with constant releases, with constant work. And the fact that you took that time, they're getting to see what you're prioritizing. And what I find so special about that is you had to, it's amazing to think about this, but you had to feel you were worthy of that time, that you had to feel like you deserved it and yeah. that you couldn't just neglect it because yes, you do have a blessed, fortunate life, which you're grateful for. Very. Tell us about that feeling of feeling worthy because I feel like that's such a- Feeling like you're enough, to be honest with you. I think, um, you know, one of the things I learned there is the, we have these core shame lies, you know, that we tell ourselves that affect us and create our fear and create our transference with other people. and it's not the root of things. I mean, I, I got a new tattoo actually when I got out. It says love more on my chest because uh, that's the number one lesson I learned. That's how you need to respond to really most things. Yeah. And I'm working on that every single day with everything. Whenever I feel resistance, I realize, oh, my God, this isn't, there's a lesson for me here. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I had to realize is that I'm, I'm good enough because there's this weird thing that like you kind of go through life wondering, are you good enough? And all these things are happening for you and you're wondering, do I really deserve this? Am I good enough? The other th thing I realized was none of us truly love ourselves unconditionally. And then how are we supposed to love other people unconditionally? To me, the way God loves us is unconditional. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I really had to go through and to, you know, when I'm reminding myself every day in my daily meditations now is that one, you're good enough, two, you're lovable, to everyone else deserves love. And then the biggest thing I'm, I'm realizing is that I need to trust, you know, trust in the unknown because you go out there and you, I gotta make this happen. You, I'm, I'm gonna sleep when I'm dead, like all these <laughs> different things. And the truth is what happened to me in my life is statistically impossible. So someone upstairs was looking out and they've given me a life with every single sign that God loves me and is looking out for me. Yet I wasn't showing that respect of saying, I trust that you love me. I trust that everything's gonna be okay. And giving that trust to the universe, I've seen amazing, miraculous things start to happen in my life. Um, and I, I can tell you, it's almost like I'm prospering better than ever before because of that. And the challenges have been getting harder and harder and continuing but it's almost like these tools now are allowing me for the waves to hit me and I'm swimming through them and I'm understanding with everything there's something else to be learned. Yeah. See, when, when I'm hearing you say it, you can tell that it's been so realized because a lot of these things, we hear them in daily talk, like, oh yeah, you should learn from everything in life and every, every challenge has a lesson and an opportunity. But when you hear someone say it and they're living it, it, it just, it sounds different and it hits different. And the biggest thing you said, which really resonated with me just now is the idea of the love more, the tattoo you got. I read this incredible statement from a writer called Russell Barkley. He's no longer with us, but the statement he said, like literally this is like, it's changed how I view every situation and it, and it correlates so similarly to the experience you had. So Russell Barkley said, people who need the most love often ask for it in the most unloving ways. <laughs> and literally every day when I'm living my life, I see people ask me for love, sometimes in the most unloving ways. And I think we've all experienced that. Big time. Where someone's criticizing you, but really they just want love. Where someone's uh, trying to get something from you or reaching out to you, but they want love. Like everyone's ultimately seeking love, but they are seeking it through validation or attention or well, recognition. Look, I, and I think we learned that as a kid. I mean... I, I, I told my dad, you know, recently that you loved me so unconditionally that I see through the lies of fear, mm. you know, because how, you know, we we're giving our kids in a weird way, sometimes transactional love mm -hmm. because we're trying to teach them lessons. And then you go through life. And I never thought I was a transactional person because I'm not like that with money. Yeah. But I realized I was like that weirdly with love, you know, and and I was like that with respect. Oh, I'm not gonna, you know, you gotta respect me. Respect is earned. 
well, actually, I can give respect without receiving it. Yes. You know, I can give love without receiving it. You know, I can do that for my own self. I'm just going to respond with kindness because that's what I'm working on. And by the way, it doesn't always work. Mm. Like there are mornings you wake up and you're fresh. We're human. And I think a beautiful thing my teacher said to me recently, he said, why are you giving yourself these unrealistic expectations? And it was so beautiful what he said. It was, he said, if, if you say to yourself, I'm going to work out every single day this month, and then you miss one workout, you know what you normally do? You end up missing three or four yeah. because you're kind of ashamed that you missed that one. So you kind of fall off the wagon. Yeah. The truth is, stop giving yourself this crazy expectation and give yourself some self-compassion. We're not perfect. We're flawed. Mm. So if I miss that workout, you know what? That's okay. I'll get back on it tomorrow. Mm-hmm. You know, and the same thing goes with anger, with frustration, you're allowed to fall and stumble and then realize it and get back on. And that's the biggest thing I'm working on because Mm. I'm a perfectionist. I want to, you know, I want to get this learning right, but, (laughs) but it doesn't, it doesn't end here. You know, it's, if it ends, I die, (laughs) you know, and then I get probably come back and learn again. Yeah. Um, which is by the way, anyone wants to understand you and I have talked about this many lives, many masters by Brian Weiss is a very good book to read to kind of just give yourself an idea of why thinking about reincarnation is such a beautiful way to look at life. Yes, um, absolutely. But yeah, yeah. I, it's th- these are the things you and I talk about. I this, know this. You know, com- this oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I'm just <laughs> saying it's uh, p- people like get on the podcast and they're like, "We're going to talk career and everything else." And I said, "I want to do Jays because we're probably not going to talk any career." <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, well, for me, it's just this coming from hashtag No Days Off. Yeah. So when I met you, it was hashtag No Days Off, and. I'm, I'm going down on a personal, but we worked out together. I have never thrown up that bad in my <laughs> life. If you remember. Yeah, I was a little out of control with the expectations of working out at I the time. was like. I was like, are you okay? <laughs> we worked out together. We did this crazy circuit. And I don't like high intensity for anyone who's listening or watching. And literally we did this workout. And, I, you know, I mean, you could tell Scooter's got a completely different body to mine. I'm doing I'm, his. I'm not, I'm not like I was back then. But I no, will say, this is you hard. are competitive. Yeah. Because you would not tell me you weren't okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I just said, Jay, you look a little, no, I'm good. I'm good. Let's keep going. Yeah. And there were three of us and you didn't want to be the one person falling out. And then finally, <laughs> excuse me, you're spinning. Um, finally, you literally sat down on the ground and you're like, I'm not okay. <laughs> <laughs> and you just, you said, I'm going to go to the bathroom and you disappeared for a good 45. Yeah. Literally I was, I was puking like anything, but it was just, yeah, it was, yeah, I've always had that spirit of wanting to see how far I can go. Mm-hmm. And when I did that as a monk, there were experiences that broke me because we were doing crazy fasts, crazy meditations. And all it brought me back to was the realization that I wasn't Superman. Yeah. And and I think that that's what I'm hearing from what I'm hearing you say too, is yeah. the idea of like, no matter how able you are and how capable you are and the boundaries that you push, we all still have... And you're going to fall again. Correct. I'm I'm having this learning and having this epiphany. I'm going to break again. Yeah. You know, and and this time I have tools to put my hand on my chest and say, we all suffer. The world is filled with suffering. Give yourself some self-compassion. Yeah. You know, and and give it to others. And um, it's it's been a beautiful thing. And I, I credit some amazing people in my life who really pushed me to go there. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, when you go there, there's also sadness, Mm -hmm. you know, realizing how many things you missed because you were planning for something in the future, Mm -hmm. how many times you weren't present because you thought you had to protect something that you already had, you know, and I, I'm just grateful. I'm not going to spend another 39 years not knowing these things. Yeah. And I look forward to every five years telling you another level of learning. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Um, It has to be that way. You know, and I, and I, and I, and weirdly, like the falls are where the greatest learnings are. A thousand percent, a thousand percent. And that's, and that's the problem, right? What you just said about missing a day of a workout and then it ends up missing four days. It's the same when we go, okay, well now I'm not going to fall because I found a new place of enlightenment. And what we don't realize is again, like you said, it may not be every five days, but every three or four years, there's going to be another moment of revelation. Yeah. And when you keep thinking, oh no, no, this time I've got it. That's, that's where the mistake is made is like, oh, this time it's not going to happen. But tell me about what does it take? Because I remember you discussing the Hoffman project with me uh, when we first met and you were like, oh, I think you're going to this, et cetera. 
I want to know a bit more about the process of Hoffman so that everyone can be exposed to and understand a bit more as much as they can. But also like, what does it take for someone like you to go in that direction? Like, what does it take? What happened? What's going on in order to urge you and encouraging you? It's not as significant. Yeah, as yeah, like, it's not, no. It, it wasn't like, you know, it was funny when I went, I started, you know, my wife and I started hearing all kinds of rumors of, oh, he's gone crazy. And this that like, cause I was away and, you know, all kinds of weird things, but it wasn't that, it was just feeling like I wasn't present in my life yeah. and feeling like the people around me who love me, I felt their hurt because one, we're all coming in with our own trauma and weirdly our trauma was matching up. Mm. And I couldn't fix it. I'm a fixer. You know, I'm the guy who, since I was a kid, I'm gonna make it be okay for everybody. And there was this, I just couldn't fix things in this moment in time. And suddenly, because I couldn't fix things, I started to spiral. I, I started to literally lean more into my negative patterns of, of wanting to control things because I couldn't fix things. And my heart was in the best place. I wanted everything to be okay and everyone to be happy, mm -hmm. but I couldn't get everything in the right place. And I'd been playing that chess game for so long and the board was getting away from me. And suddenly I realized a very dark thought came into my head. The, the ultimate, I'm not enough. The ultimate, mm -hmm. I shouldn't be here. And that's not me. Yeah. And when that thought entered my mind, I said, what are you doing here? I said, whoa, whoa, whoa that, I've never gone that dark. Yeah. And I signed up for the Hoffman process the next day. Mm. Um, Why Hoffman? Tell us a bit about it for anyone who doesn't know, because I, um, I think I, I love giving credit where it's due to places and retreats. Started, that... started by a guy named Bob Hoffman. In the United States, there's one in the Napa area and there's one in Connecticut. Um, an amazing woman named Liza was the one who is one of the co-CEOs with her husband and it's a nonprofit. It's just an amazing process that really delves into spirituality, delves into early childhood, delves into your trauma, your patterns. Um, and you give yourself over for basically seven days. No phone, no, no email. No phone, no email. No, no even to your kids or your no wife. No working out, no book, no nothing. And Writing? No, there's a lot of writing. What I will say to you is, I don't want to go into what the process is because it's important whoever does it Goes there. Is, go, is surprised. Mm. But what was interesting is I started, I had certain people, you know what you need? You need to go to Hoffman. And I had canceled four times. And <laughs> it was always a reason, I'm not going to go to this. I don't need this. Like, I'm busy. And one of my friends, who's one of the most brilliant friends I have, um, he said to me, when I went in, I went in to manipulate it so I can come out and show the people I love, look, I did this, aren't you proud of me? Because mm -hmm. someone that, you know, he loved had done it. And he looked at me and he said, you can't manipulate this. Mm -hmm. And I was fascinated that he said that because he's such a smart guy. And I'm like, what could they really do in a week? And he said, it's gonna be the most remarkable experience of your life. And my other friend, Penny had said it to me and, you know, and I, um, I decided I'm gonna go and, it felt like I was, it was gone for a year almost, mm -hmm. you know, and I really gave myself over to this process and made really amazing friendships. Um, I wasn't like sharing, you share feelings and, you know, different things. And I opened up in a way that I never expected. And I laugh now because I, I look back at the timeline of when we did things because I had this workbook and I realized that day two, I remember having such an intimate conversation with my teacher and I thought that must've been day five. It was day two, <laughs> you know, and you went in deep yeah, I went in deep and, um, I uncovered a lot of things and I realized a lot of things about myself, about my patterns, about forgiveness for myself, understanding of things, um, forgiveness of others. Um, and, and I was just eternally grateful. And what was interesting is when I came out, I had this oh, I'm so happy. I'm so in love with life and myself and the world and people. And I came back and I entered a lot of darkness. Um, and, and the tools that I got at Hoffman allowed me to understand that the darkness was because that's what God wanted me to have. Mm -hmm. That's what, there were lessons that I needed to learn. I'd now been given these tools and there was no darkness. Mm. There was an opportunity to learn. There was an opportunity 
to go deeper every single day. And I always found that when I was doing my meditations, the biggest revelations were my deepest breaths. My longest, deepest breaths, I'd have the deepest revelations. And I, in one of my meditations, I realized that's life. Mm. I've been going around taking <laughs> these quick breaths, treating my life that way. And I wasn't slowing down enough in life to take a deep breath and let it come to me. Mm. Um, and, and that is, that just comes down to, you know, self-forgiveness and, yeah. you know, and a lot of, uh, a lot of beautiful things. And I'm really grateful to, you know, the people, I will never say who I was there with because they don't do that. And no one has ever said I was there. This is actually the first time I publicly said that I was there. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it was a very cool thing. I, I'm very grateful. And and now sharing this, there's so many other people who come to me of like their things of self-work that they've done. Yeah. And they're like, you should try this and try this. And it's it's just a very exciting place to be. And I can tell you the greatest gift of all is for my children. Mm. You know, I... I was a good dad before. I loved my kids. I would come home every night and put them to sleep. And, you know, and I'm, I'm married to super mom. Um, She's awesome. Yeah. And I am present with my children in a way that I didn't know possible before. Mm. And I think that's the greatest thing Hoffman gave me. It's, it's, so, it's so beautiful listening to someone have that experience. Like I could sit here and just listen to you all day because <laughs> it's, it is, it, it's so gratifying to the soul, like on a much more deeper spiritual level to hear someone having that experience and, and, and doing that work. And how does that, and I, and I do want to talk a bit about career on this, on this level of frequency, because what I'm fascinated by, and I think this is what people often don't see as symbiotic is how spiritual insight leads to spiritual career practice. How does, how does someone like you take this very profound experience and work? And by the way, having known you for a few years, like I know that this wasn't just seven days of work. This is years and years and years and years There's of work. There's a lot leading up to this. Yeah, exactly. In seven days where the seven days like accelerates and yeah. like really makes it powerful and meaningful. But that you've been doing this for a while and thinking about these things for a while. How does that then manifest in your work? How do you take this energy? Is it how you're dealing with people? Is it how you're creating stuff? How does someone do that? Because I think a lot of people, even I get asked this question a lot, is like they see spirituality and business is like almost separate. Yeah, I completely disagree. Yeah, same. You know, the other thing I, I want to point out, because I've been thinking a lot about this, is that the same way I said that I believe you get the lessons when you're supposed to get them, mm -hmm. I believe you're supposed to... I don't think I should have had this mentality in the beginning of my career. Mm. I think that I'm mm. exactly where I'm supposed to be. The universe wants me to be exactly where I am. So things, I needed to be a certain way at certain points to learn those things, for those things to happen. And now this is where I am at 39. Mm. And this is where I needed to learn. And now, you know, I'm, I'm having a different kind of grace. I'm having a different kind of empathy. I'm understanding to let go and allow people to have their process and their journey in a different way because I'm understanding my own in a different way. Um, I'm, I'm not having this need to justify. You know, there's times where I'm, I'm seeing how I'm like, well, they're, they're seeing my growth as like, Oh, he got there. And I'm sitting there like, well, you haven't got there either. And I'm, I'm smiling to myself because it's not my place to say that because it wasn't their place to say it to me, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm, I'm here to, you know, it's almost funny. We talk about different religions, you and I, and I'm Jewish, you know, I've grown up in a Christian society and I've gotten to a place also where understanding, I don't want to live my Judaism in fear, mm -hmm. you know, thousands of years of persecution gave us strength, but also a lot of fear. Mm -hmm. and telling us we can't go near something. Yet, you know, Moses married Zipporah, who was not Jewish, and when he brought her to his people and he said, she loves me and everything, no one questioned that. Just years of assimilation and losing identity caused us to have a tremendous amount of fear, and I don't want to live with that fear anymore. I want to explore other spiritualities and be true to myself and my own. You know, I'm not afraid to hear the wisdom of another spirituality. So, you know, my friend, he was giving a sermon. He's Christian, and I listened, and I thought it was beautiful. He was saying in the book of Matthew, it's not about saying it and teaching it. It's about living it mm -hmm. and letting someone else see it. And I've now seen that, you know, we've talked about it within your religion. And 
I, I, I'm trying to get to that place of like, I don't have all the answers. I'm figuring it out every single day. I am as flawed as they get, yeah. you know, but I'm just going to try to live my best self, Yeah. you know? And, you know, last night I did a clubhouse talk with Demi mm -hmm. and um, she became my client over the past year. Yeah. And she's been through a lot. We have this amazing documentary coming out. Absolutely. And she and I were talking about her whole career. Every time she faltered, she has the strength to get back up and people call her a role model. Mm. And she's like, I'm just afraid because it's just too much perfection to live in. Yeah. And then I always crash. And she started to do interviews for this new album. And she's like, I want to be a role model. And I called her up and said, what are you doing? I said, you're giving yourself that same sense, self, you know, perfection that, cause you to fall before. Mm. I said, like, we got to change the word. And I thought about my brother, Adam, who has a nonprofit called Pencil Promise. And he told me, I don't want to be called nonprofit. I want to be called for purpose. Mm. I don't want to say what we don't do. I want to say what we do. And, totally. And I said Love to that. Demi, stop calling yourself a role model. Let's go with real model. Mm -hmm. You're a real person and you are flawed and you are imperfect and you are honest and you don't have to be perfect ever again. And we like that. And that's how she's saying now. Yeah. And I think if we start treating ourselves and others with this same sense of, that's why I hate cancel culture. I mean, I understand we all have a lot of pain, but if we don't op give people an opportunity for growth, what are we doing? We're just giving the next generation the same pain, mm. you know? And I, and it's a hard thing to ask people. It's a hard thing to ask when you've been abused, when you've been persecuted, when you've been mistreated, to love your neighbor, yeah, you know, it, that's a very tall order. And, and I don't think it's my right to tell someone to do it, mm -hmm. but I can choose to start doing it in my own life. And I can tell you it's hard. Yeah, It's hard. And I falter and I stumble sometimes. And I, I said to my wife just the other day, I said, hey, I caught myself the other day. I was upset with someone and how they treated me. So I made a comment to you that wasn't the kindest comment about them. Mm. You know, it wasn't awful, but I just wasn't giving them their credit because I was upset about something that happened to me. Yeah. I said, if you catch me doing that, can you just, if you notice it, just tell me to stay in my heart. And she was like, I got you. And I think that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to stay there. Yeah. And that's that accountability culture. Like, you know, you have someone in your life that you're being accountable to your wife in this example. Yeah. And like, that feeling of we do need accountability. We want to be accountable to ourselves, to the people we love, the people that are important. And I just want to point out, I don't know if you know this, how perfect it was that you said the real and role models thing. Tupac said, we need real models, not role models. And I'm looking at him, <laughs> I'm looking at you. And I'm like- I'll take my shirt off. Yeah, <laughs> yeah show me the more love, uh, yeah, love exactly. more tattoo. Uh, but, but it's so, that's such a beautiful point. And, and you know, I, I want to share this because we talked about this and I, and I struggle with that. So me and my wife, when we talk about relationships, we talk about our mistakes. If you listen to our podcast, she's been my guest three times. Every year we do an episode together and we talk about everything we get wrong. And the number one comment will be hashtag relationship goals. Or the number one comment will be like hashtag cutest couple or whatever it is. And my comment back will be, please listen to what I'm saying. And so what I find is that we've been conditioned and programmed to want someone to be perfect. Yeah. Demi, you, Justin, uh, you know, Ariana, whoever, uh, me and my wife. No and one's perfect. None of us are perfect. That's why you and I talked once. I said, um, we're, we're made to serve, not to be worshipped. A thousand Because no percent. one can live up to worship. No one, apart from God. God, yeah, that's yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, worship God, serve each other. Yes. I love that. That thought is, is perfect and beautiful. But that's what I mean, that because we've been conditioned to want to worship humans, we direct that worship into an athlete, into a singer, into a teacher, into a guide, whoever it is. But it's a shame that even when you have someone opening up and saying what it's actually like, our programming up here is so strong that we still project perfection. So now the new trend is, before it was, if you were flawless, or at least presented yourself as flawless, that was considered worship worthy. Today now it's the opposite. If someone's really vulnerable, that's worship worthy. But the point is what you just said is let's move away from worship completely and let's just serve and support each other. I want to say two things to yeah. this. One is about you and one is about me. Okay. <laughs> um, it's good. We're both in the room. I'm going to go with you first just because, and then I can end on me so you don't feel bad. A little over a year ago, you called me and you said, can we go for a walk? And we went for a walk 
And I said, this is the unfortunate thing that we do to each other. We get to this place where we just want to tear each other down. Mm -hmm. And there's that line in Batman where they say, you know, if you do it, you know, well long, I forgot the line perfectly, but it's like, if you do it well long, right. If you do something long enough. You too can be the villain. Yeah, or I know exactly. You know what I mean? Wait, like, wait, wait, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, it's, wait, it's, let me find it's, it. It's a good line. It's, I think, I think uh, Heath said it as the yeah, Joker. Yeah. You either die a hero or live long enough to see yourself become a villain. Yeah, it's there you great. go. It's Batman. Yeah, yeah. Yep. And and yeah. and that's so spot on. And what we do to each other. Mm -hmm. And for me, I I recently watched um, the uh, Queen's Gambit special, yeah. the, the show on Netflix, which was fantastic. And I had, coming out of Hoffman and seeing that, I just had this epiphany that I had been this chess player my whole life. I had stared at the board, and people would come and show me attention and affection because of my skills on that board. So I thought, oh, that's love. So I'm gonna keep playing this game. And people said, wow, you're really good at this. You're smart. You, you look at the career you're building, look at the life you're building. The chess pieces are moving and moving and moving and moving. But I never took the time to stop, take a breath and say, hey, I'm really good at this game. Mm -hmm. If you ever wanna talk about it, I'm happy to, but my name's Scott, nice to meet you mm -hmm. until now. Mm -hmm. And so many people that loved me didn't know me. That's where the darkness was coming from because I don't feel like I've changed. I feel like I've reclaimed myself. Mm. And that was the gift of this year. You know, I, and I've had so many friends, oh, there, you've such a change. I shaved because when I was doing a meditation, I saw the spiritual version of myself that I wanted to be. I didn't have a beard. <laughs> and I literally shaved that night and I haven't had a beard since. Yeah. And I feel good because I went back and got me, you know, and, and I love the person that I was all these years. And that's a part of me. I just reclaimed the rest of me. Mm -hmm. You know, I was relying too much on one side of the body. I went and got the rest. And now I'm walking in a straight line and not putting so much pressure on my right foot. Yeah. You know? Um, that must feel good. <laughs> it does. And yeah. I have this teacher now who literally... I will lay out things that have been done to me that are very, anyone else would be like, and he looks at me and goes, well, what role did you play? Yeah. And it's an interesting thing because you go through life just learning. Yeah. And, you know, I think that's why, you know, I, I would look and people would be, God, well, God forgave me. And I'd get frustrated growing up because I'd be like, you're just making an excuse using God. Yeah. But I actually now realize why was I frustrated that they felt forgiven? That was my stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm angry that they felt forgiven because I hadn't forgven myself, myself for something. Yes. You know, yeah. and, and I had my own work to do and I was projecting my stuff on them. Yeah. And the truth is, if we can all get to a place, if God sees everything that we're doing, he sees our messy because mm -hmm. we're all messy, mm -hmm. but he loves our messy. If we can get to a place, we start to love each other in the messy that's when you start to feel really loved. Mm -hmm. You know, I started to love myself in the messy. Mm -hmm. Now I'm loving other people in my life in the messy. And that's real love. It's, it's not, it's easy to love somebody when they're showing up for you all the time. Yeah. It's easy to love someone when they're doing the, good, when they're doing good and they're giving you this ideal of perfection that makes you feel good, mm -hmm. you know, or not even perfection. They just make you feel good. It's so much harder to love somebody when they disappoint you. Yeah. You know, and what I've started to realize is through my own actions, if someone's disappointed me or when I've disappointed someone else, it's because I'm really disappointed in myself. You know, I'm projecting it onto yeah. somebody. And that's where that empathy comes from. And you and I could talk about this for hours. <laughs> and, and I'm the first one to say, I'm scratching the surface of this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just figuring it out. I'm screwing yeah. up on a daily basis. Yeah. And I'm just starting to really give myself empathy for the first time. Yeah. And I'm excited about it. And I'm excited to learn. I'm excited to dig in. And I'm excited to be present. Yeah. I'm excited to have long conversations with people and like look them in their eyes. Like I'm looking you in your gorgeous eyes there. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I'm, I've always been, I want to honor you because I've always been grateful that you and I have had these conversations. Yeah, me too. I mean, it's been big for me because I think for me too, it's like you don't, you don't, you know, when, when things are changing and moving and growing fast and 
you're not even aware of half the things. And you, I mean, you do a million things. And so, and that's, and that's partly the mistake also, because you start recognizing, oh, well, if I'm not aware or if I'm not conscious of everything I'm doing, then maybe I do need to slow down. Maybe I do need to change something. Maybe I do need to find the right people to be around me. And, and it all comes back to everything's trying to remind you to be conscious, to be awake, yep. to not try and get away with being asleep. Like everything's trying to wake you up all the time. Whereas we want to go to sleep in some areas of our life. We want to be, <laughs> you know, like you want to be able to just let go of this thing here over here. It's so exciting. Yeah, it is. When exciting. you start to have these discoveries within yourself that you want to share. So it's almost like, hey, the thing you, you've been learning the most when you're not talking, <laughs> you know? So it's like this dichotomy. And then there's that grace of just like, it's okay. Yeah. I don't have to be so hard on myself. No. If I'm excited today, yeah, maybe I'm going to over talk. Yeah. That's okay. Tomorrow I can be quiet. Well, this you know? is an interview with you. <laughs> yeah, so. but, but I'm just saying like, it's, it's that, it's giving yourself that grace of like, and that, that's another pattern. Like as a kid, like, yeah. you know, you dim your light a little bit, like, oh, yeah. you're being too loud. And getting to a place in your life where, you know, when you're, when you, your child is running in front of you and they're being louder, they, you're not holding a grudge against your child. Mm. We hold these grudges as adults against ourselves and each other. But when we watch children play, they move on so quickly. <laughs> and I wish we can get back to a little bit of that, you know, within ourselves. It's, you know, even today I found myself just now being like, oh, you're talking too much. <laughs> and then maybe I am, but that's okay. You know, give myself a little bit of grace. Like, that's okay. Yeah. And you know what? I can shut up too. And like, <laughs> there's no right or wrong here. It's two friends having a conversation and a bunch of people listening yeah. and everyone's going to have a different reaction. Yeah. And that's okay. Yeah. What does compassion mean? When we say being compassionate with ourselves, it means to change your behavior enough so that you've shown that you've learned, <laughs> but it means to love yourself as you're growing and yeah. changing that Which behavior. Which is confusing. It's confusing, <laughs> but that's what it means. Because when people hear the word compassion, they think, oh, you're just being soft on yourself. Like, oh, oh, you're not judging yourself, which means you're not holding yourself accountable. But being compassionate means I know I need to change my behavior. I'm going to start doing that, but I'm going to love myself while I do that. And I think, it's, I love that you said that because let's take it a step further. Let's go back to that workout. Yeah. Right? If I'm actually being compassionate with myself, I'll get back on it the next day. Yes. You know, it, it's, we act as if we're, especially with cancel culture, we move in such a finite way. We don't think long-term. We don't think in judging our lives. We judge in the moment. And then we judge moments mm -hmm. later, mm -hmm. you know? So it, it's, the compassion to me is allow yourself to understand you're just in a moment in a very long story. Yeah. You know, and your story is not written yet. It, yes. You're just writing part of it right now. Mm -hmm. And a great story is never stagnant. Yeah. So how would your teachers tell you to treat each moment? Like, how do they, how do they say to go about it? Because the one thing I'm working on is, well, you still have to show up. Mm -hmm. You still yeah. have to show up to every moment. But yeah. how do your teachers tell you to show up to each moment? How do they tell you to treat it mentally as you go into it? The biggest mantra that was stated at the start of a moment was don't judge the moment. As soon as you label a moment, it now gets labeled in that jar or that box or that filing cabinet and cupboard. And then now you never reflect on whether that label was right or wrong. So just be. So just be, because if you label, it's, it's the labeling type. The mind wants to label things to make it simpler. That yeah. was a good experience. That was a bad experience. That was a good taco. That was a bad taco. That was a good restaurant. It was a bad restaurant. But as soon as you label it, you now don't allow that to become anything else. What if that restaurant evolves? So the idea of labeling simplifies for the mind, but actually makes the long-term complex. So the idea is instead of labeling, allow yourself to experience allow yourself to re-experience. And then if multiple experiences obviously give you the same experience, then you may put a label in pencil. But you're penciling labeling. You're not putting like a permanent marker. You know, it's funny. My teacher uses the word be curious. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's, it's not be definitive. Yes. You know, be curious. Yes, exactly. And, but I want to play this game with you a little Let's bit. Do it. I want to challenge you a little bit. I love it. Only Let's because do, yeah. I want people listening to your podcast to hear yeah. you respond to this stuff because I think yeah. you're brilliant about this. For those people who are listening to this podcast saying, okay, I get all this like, you know, growth and learning and everything else, but COVID's been hard and I've, I don't have a job right now and mm -hmm. I can't pay my bills. And I've looked up who Scooter Braun is and 
this guy financially, he's not in the same place as me and he's out of touch and he can talk about all this spiritual learning, but he doesn't know what I'm going through. They're right. They're right. I do not know their experience. I don't know anyone else's experience. I only know my own. But what I wanted to ask you is, what is your response to someone who is saying, this is easy to talk about, but what about in this capitalistic society that I live in, if I'm doing all this, I, I think I need to kind of just bury my head in the sand and just work, 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 work. I don't have time for feelings and relationship. I need to get this money. Mm-hmm. Because I've gone on this new app, Clubhouse, many times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I go into these rooms and I hear everybody talking about, get this money, get this money. How do I get to the top? How do I do this? How do I do that? And every time I go in a room, I keep trying to stay. The top of the mountain isn't what you expect. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to kind of push you on that. Because um, you have extraordinary people who are living extraordinary lives coming on here. And there are a lot of people out there. And I was once in you know certain positions, but... I'm not in that position right now. And I'm sensitive to that and I'm compassionate to that. What do you tell somebody who says, this is all nice and everything, but I don't get, I don't have that liberty. Yeah. So the first thing I'd say is that we all get to choose what our intention right now in life is. And if that's the intention that makes you happy and suits you, that's fine. Like I wouldn't even, I don't even want to edit it. I don't even want to convince you of anything because I remember being in a similar position myself not so long back, a few years ago, and I know that I had an intention to make a choice. At the same time, I would say to them, if you're open to the idea that there is a better, smarter, more fulfilling way to go about making money, building a business, finding your way to the top, whatever you want to call it, then this is that path. And if you're open to that, than what you're hearing from Scooter. But again, what I loved you said, and you actually made this really clear, there was a mindset, you've got to this at the right time for you. Yeah. Which I'm remembering because that means that that person, whoever's saying that is gonna get to this. I've, I don't know anyone who I meet who doesn't get to this. Whether they're a billionaire or whether they just started out. I was lucky enough to get it at 18 when I met my monk teachers. Mm. This is the stuff I was talking about at 18 years old <laughs> because that's what I was given in this life. And there are some people that I've met that have taken until 70 to get it. Some people are in their 30s. And the point is that you are going to have to get here at some point. Everyone's going to have to get to this point. And you need the context from before. Correct. I, and, I, that's what my, I, I love But just do this. whatever you do intentionally. No, that's my, my teacher said to me, he goes, you're exactly where you're supposed to be. And it's, you know, Coretta Scott King said, each generation has to fight the fight all over again. Yes. You know, it. all of us. None of us get out unscathed no one. and all of us get the blessing of the journey. Yeah. You know, and I was thinking about, you know, the, this, you know, the teaching we all get in our Judeo-Christian society of Adam and Eve and this idea that we sinned and we were cast out. Yeah. We were punished. We were punished. We were cast out. We realized we were nude. We were ashamed. That's why we started wearing clothes, all this different stuff. And I started thinking about that as a parent because we're all God's children. Mm -hmm. So I was like, well, let me rephrase this in my mind. When I give my child a consequence or a punishment, I don't do it because I'm mad at them. I do it because I love them and I'm trying to guide them to an important lesson. And I realized that my idea of this idea that the original sin took place was wrong. I believe that all of us, because God loves us, and wants us to learn are given the gift of life and the gift of struggle and the gift of being cast out so that we can go and get the context we need to appreciate the garden of Eden, the heaven. Yeah. So the spirituality, the enlightenment. Mm -hmm. And it's been an exciting way to look at things now. Yeah. That everything, that's why I loved reading many lives, many masters, because when I kind of, realize that a lot of major religions in spirituality actually all believe in reincarnation. reincarnation. Kabbalah talks about reincarnation. A lot of major religions talk about reincarnation in their spirituality practices. And when you read this book, which is a true story, and you kind of understand that if you just kind of accept that you get to come back and you're always learning, you start to not fear death anymore. Mm -hmm. And you start to realize this is going to be hard. There are days my heart's going to ache. There are days I'm not going to want, I feel like I can't breathe because I'm hurting. 
But all of those feelings, all of that is helping us learn things and give us context for greater lessons. Yeah. And I'm in it and I'm excited. And I know that the funny part is I've come to terms with the fact of like, oh, I'm not here to have this great life. I love my life and I'm grateful. And I'm going to, like I've told you, you know, I'm going to keep pouring my glass in other people's glasses. Yeah. But I think the thing I'm most thrilled about is now I understand that pain is coming. Mm -hmm. Happiness is coming. Mm -hmm. Joy is coming. Heartache is coming. When I least expect it, because the fact that I wake up every morning and I'm still breathing means that there's something else for me to learn. I kind of take some joy in that now. Yeah. But see this, but oh, oh, what you just said, it, that when you just said at the end, that last statement you said, but I take joy in that now, that was, th this sounds intense, but it's actually beautiful. And that's where the joy part comes in. So when we were trained, the scripture would say that life is about education, not enjoyment. Like life's about enlightenment, not enjoyment. Now, what I mean by that is the joy of learning is the joy of life, but we are seeking enjoyment through the temporary pleasure, through <laughs> the external satisfaction, through the quick win, through the top, through the mountain, whatever it may be. And as soon as you switch that, so every area you walk, if you walked into every room today and you went in there and said, how can I learn from it and how can I serve in it? Versus how can I enjoy this moment? I love that. That's the difference. I love that. We walk into every room going, how can I enjoy this? You see a woman or a man, you go, how can I enjoy them? You see a house, you go, how can I enjoy this? You know, it's funny. I'm thinking to myself, well, where's the struggle? The struggle is when I haven't learned the lesson from the last room and I'm still stuck on that lesson <laughs> and I got to walk into the next room. Yeah. And that's where you start to get in a vicious cycle. And, you know, it's like you start to falter. Give yourself that grace of, hey, let's slow down. Let's take that big, deep breath. Yeah. Let's reset. It's why, you know, when you... We went on that trip together. You guys were waking up every morning and meditating. Yeah. And I was like, oh, I've learned TM. I now meditate every morning. Yeah. And it has changed my life. Yes. And you know what? Let me rephrase that. I try to meditate every morning. <laughs> yeah. There are days that I miss. Yeah. And now I give myself the grace of, I'll get back on it tomorrow. Or maybe yeah. I'll do a quick one tonight. Yeah. You know, I'm not, oh, I meditate every day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's, yeah. I... I enjoy meditating. I like what it does for me. And I'm, if I miss one, I give myself that grace and I get back on the you know, horse tomorrow. Yeah. Um, but that's what I mean, that, that, that the joy, like people go, well, then where's the fun in life? If I'm always learning, where's the fun? The learning is the, the fun, fun part. Like when you come into a new place and like your teacher said, you're curious. Like when you came in here, you were like looking at the quotes, yeah. looking at the people. You're not trying to enjoy the art. You're like curious and you want yeah. to learn. That is the fun that's of life. That's childlike. That's childlike, exactly. Where it's, a childish mentality is to enjoy. Well, you know, it's funny. As I started diving into all the different major religions, yeah. there's a quote in almost every major religion that talks about God. If you like, they, they ask Jesus, they say, show me, you know, show me God. And he yeah. says, look at the child. Yeah. And yeah. in Judaism, they say it. And in Hindu, yeah. they say it. Yeah. Like all these different, every religion, you'll find something that points to the child yeah. and the innocence of the child and the love the child has. And, you know, for me, I talked to... Um, someone who actually went to Hoffman after me. Mm. And, you know, this person hit me up and they were like, I'm losing the high. Life is pulling me back in. I'm getting depressed. I'm losing the high that I had three weeks ago when I got out. Mm. How do I get it back? And I said, I don't know if I'm right, but I'll try and answer this question. <laughs> and the way I'm going to answer it, I don't know if you're going to like. <laughs> I said, you got a high because you dealt with your worst demons. Mm. And then you gave yourself forgiveness and you learned. Mm. If you want to get that high again, stop looking for the happiness. Look for the resistance. Look for the lessons in the resistance. And when you have the epiphany again, you'll get that high back. Yeah, and that's, that's exactly the point I'm making is that we're looking for the high in life yeah. constantly. We're looking for the enjoyment. We're looking for that uh, release, that, that fun moment. But you got that experience from the work, yeah, right? And, and that's such a beautiful way of looking at it. Tell me about some of the projects that you're working on right now that excite you the most, that you feel like are allowing you to love more. Some of these could be, I know, SB projects, media work, but it also could be some of the philanthropy work that you're doing that behind the scenes. Some of the work that you feel so excited and proud of, because I also want to give you an opportunity, as I want everyone who's listening to have the opportunity, to celebrate the stuff that they're excited about. Because again, you'll dim your own light, so... I'm going to ask you to 
Such brag a, about what you did. No, so I appreciate that, yeah. but it's it's a, it's weird because of where I am right now. Service based. Yeah, it, but even service based. I mean, I am having the most joy out of watching people that I supported have their own wins. Mm. Weirdly, that is my biggest joy right now. Mm. Watching Justin Bieber take ownership of this album the way he has, ownership of the performances the way he has, ownership of his decision-making the way he has. This is the most hands-on he's ever been in his career. This is the most he's fought to push back on all of us to say, I got this. And I told him the other day, proud is not the word. I respect it. Mm. I respect it so much. I'm so happy to see where Ariana is in her personal life, in her decision-making, in her choosing to face so much trauma she's been through mm. publicly um, and be the person that she is. I'm grateful watching this Demi documentary like I'm blown away by her, you know. I'm, I can't wait to see it. You know, I'm Andrew Watt just won Producer of the Year. I know the year and a half that he's had, and for him to come out the other side and then tell me the Grammy was amazing, but the work I'm doing on myself has been the greatest reward. I mean, I'm really proud of a lot of people in my professional life, and then I'm really proud of the people in my personal life because I'm seeing them do the same thing. Mm -hmm. So it's weird, like the accolades for me aren't necessarily the fact that I'm moving the chess pieces. I did that for a really long time. Mm -hmm. It's that I'm seeing all these other people who've been around me in my life and I'm looking over at their chessboard and I'm admiring their game. Yeah. You know, I'm admiring their game and I'm admiring who they are and I'm admiring who they're showing up to be, and I'm, I'm just admiring their journey. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not passing judgment. I'm just enjoying watching. I'm curious. Yeah. You know, and to me, the funny thing is, in the last six months since I've let go more, commercially, I think I've had more success than I've ever had in my life mm. because I'm trusting. And I think there's a weird reward in trusting the universe mm -hmm. because I'm, I'm finding that joy and things have not been easy at times. Um, but I'm leaning into those uneasy times and saying, where, what is this resistance? Like, why am I hurting? What does that really mean? What is there for me to learn there? And I'm doing that as often as I possibly can. That's what I'm celebrating. That's what I'm excited about. I'm, getting to a deeper place. And I'm hoping that my friends like you hold me accountable in six months when I start getting out of that yeah. and remind me of this and yeah. say, get, are you doing your meditations? <laughs> Have a little you know, self-compassion that you've missed a bunch. <laughs> now you're get, giving me permission to do that. Yeah, I want it. that yeah, because yeah, it, yeah. I think that's what friends are for, right? If you give them permission. Yeah, 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 I, yeah. I give you full permission yeah, 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 yeah. to keep me accountable, to make me continue to learn. The same way I said to my wife, yeah. tell me to get back in my heart. You know, like... And, and I think we all should be that for each other, but not in a judgmental way. Yeah. I'll probably reach out and say, let's meditate together. Today. Yeah, sure. That's what I'll do. So sure. that I'm accountable too. Yeah. Because, yeah, it's, yeah. But it's, yeah. I, I, like I said, I've always been grateful for our friendship. Yeah. I've been grateful knowing that I have a friend who's as spiritual as you are and enjoys the conversations of spirituality um, because it allows you push me. And you inspire me, and I'm grateful for this friendship. Well, you're the same, man. I, I feel like the way you've opened up today, and, and this is what I'd like, this is what I try and do on this podcast. Everyone who's been listening or watching, for me, I like learning about the full human. So when I sit down with someone, I'm not seeing them as an athlete or a manager or a artist, or I'm, I'm seeing you as a complete spiritual being. And I wanna hear that story. So when you're listening to this, whoever's listening or watching, listen to that story with every one of our episodes and this one included as well, because it's so easy to listen to interviews these days and people pick out the one little thing and then it, that becomes the meme and the whatever it is. And it's like, but you missed the point of the whole conversation. Like, again, what we've been encouraging for our own selves as well, 
Just as you, if you don't give someone else the permission to have context, we are blocking ourselves from having context of our own self. Yeah. And that's the biggest thing I've learned from today, hearing you say it, which reaffirms my belief of the understanding that if you're not giving someone a chance to explain, express, be curious, make mistakes, then you're basically blocking yourself from doing the same thing. I agree. And, and the more permission you give everyone to do that, the more you it give yourself to permission to say, what was my role? Yeah, I um, love that. What was know, my role? Because I think one. that's where it starts. If you can forgive yourself yeah. for something you might not even recognize, yeah. then it's much easier. Yeah. You asked me what happened earlier, and I, I was thinking about that just now. Like, mm. you know, is there a specific thing that happened? No, yeah. You know what happened? My wife, Yale, and my children, I learned I love somebody more than me. And loving them made me go do the work. So what happened is they were the greatest gift in my life. And for that, I'm internally grateful. Yeah. And I want each of them to have their own individual process and their own individual journey. Yeah. You know, and I want them to know that I love them and they're messy. Yeah. You know, and, and, uh, and I'm just grateful for them. That's it. Yeah. I love that, man. And, and I'm so grateful to you. I want to say it back to you because, you know, when I've gone through my tough times, you really get to see who shows up for you, especially when they're a newer friend or someone you're just getting to know. And, and when you've stuck by me and, and supported me, not in a, we've never had a relationship. Where it's not just like, oh, yeah, yeah, we're boys. Like, it's not like that. It's, let's look in the mirror. What work have you got to do? What do you need to work on? What, where are you? What is your role in this? Like that friendship, I think, is so special. And then feeling support from that. Again, loving your friends through growth, loving yourself through growth, making sure that you know you need to change, but you love someone through that change. Uh, Scooter, we end every interview with the final five, which are the rapid fire, fast five questions. So you have to answer in one word or one sentence maximum. Let's go. I am judging you and you if you talk too long <laughs> this time. And, and, I will, and I, will ask, I will ask you to expand when I get intrigued. All right. Okay. So starting with your first question, you ready? All right. The first question is, what's the best advice you've ever received? Um, David Geffen told me that well, first, it's love more, but really, he what comes to mind is David Geffen told me that in a hundred, if you don't know who he is, look him up. He said, in a hundred years, no one's going to remember me, so they sure as hell won't remember you. Don't have an ego. <laughs> and I, I loved it. That is a great piece of advice. All right, second question. What's the worst piece of advice you've ever received? I think as a kid, you're told it's your fault. Mm. And you start to believe, oh, I'm a bad kid. I deserve that. Mm. And um, I think that was the wrong advice. Beautiful, man. All right, number three. Uh, something that you are pretty sure and confident about, but other people don't quite wrap their head around yet. Um, that Bitcoin will eventually be worth 500,000. <laughs> Ooh, you think it's going to... I think long term, yeah. yes, I, I believe in Bitcoin long term. And there's a lot of people that don't believe in it, but I believe in Bitcoin long term. Okay. All right. Well, we didn't even talk about that. So now <laughs> Bitcoin followers, which I don't think I have a lot of, uh, <laughs> don't, we'll, we'll figure it out. All right. Uh, we didn't question. talk any business, which is a lot of fun for me. Yeah? We didn't talk any business, a I lot of fun. Because that's which, not my thing. Well, also, like, and also, look, you know this, 90% of what I do in business, people don't even know, which is the way I like it. So yeah. let's keep going. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, for me, it was just, the reason why we didn't talk about business is because when I started the podcast, it was all about what can I talk to people about that no one else can do. It's also right? and you and I don't have that relationship, yeah. nor should we. Yeah. We and have a real relationship. It's not yeah. about business. It's about yeah. the person in front of you. Totally. And, and also just like you, you're prolific. You can talk about so many different things in so many different places, but this, we're going to talk about it. Like, you know, this well, is also fun talk for about me now. because you have treated me the way I actually want to treat myself. Like I told you about the chessboard of raising my head up and saying, hi, nice to meet you. I'm good at this. And I remember one time you called me and you said, hey, I don't want to over ask, but like we're friends and, you know, I'm trying to think about investing if you have any advice ever. And that was great because I, I love that. I want to be able to help a friend. And if I'm good at something, I want to be able to offer that. But you've always looked across the table and said, hi, I'm Jay. Hi, Scott, Scooter. You know, nice to meet you. Yeah. Like, let's be friends. And yeah. I, that's why I love this conversation. But yeah. sorry, go back to your rapid fire. <laughs> rapid fire. No, no, no. We got two. Yeah, this is the worst rapid fire. Ever. Yeah, let's, like, let's get intervention. back to it. Come All right. On. Last two questions, four and five. Um, oh, now, now I'm like, oh, I've got two questions left for you. What do I ask you? I know what the fifth one is. 
Uh, Are you going to have three more? Because I've done a poor job with the other one. No, no, we'll no. We'll see if we can no, go no, one word. Good, no, you've actually given beautiful answers. I We got distracted off the last one. Number four, something you once chased and no longer care about. Recognition. And fifth and final question. If you could create one law that everyone in the world had to follow, what would it be? Love more. Beautiful. Scooter Bruin, thank you, man. Thank this you, my so friend. This is so special. This is... This goes down as one of the most beautiful open conversations. Well, let's end it right. Scott Scooter Bronx. Now you know all of me, buddy. So now I call you Scott from now on. You can call me Scott Scooter, whatever you want. But but now it's, yeah, all of me is here. I went and did that. And I got to tell you, I'm so grateful we did this. And I'm so grateful for your friendship. And uh, I'm just proud of you as a friend for the message you delivered to the world. Thank you, man. And I'm proud of you for having the courage to always be open and vulnerable and honest and live your truth and for doing the work when externally you don't need to. Uh, You know, that's the hardest part when, when actually, like you said, you could convince yourself to not do the work because things are good. Um, If we're we're breathing, it means we got work to do. Absolutely. Thank you, man. Thank you. Thank you. Love you, buddy. That was awesome, man. If you want even more videos just like this one, make sure you subscribe and click on the boxes over here. I'm also excited to let you know that you can now get my book, Think Like a Monk, from thinklikeamonkbook.com. Check below in the description to make sure you order today.